So uh, when I think of innovation, I mean, a lot of people have, they have different definitions of innovation, but I like to think of it as going all the way to uh, a product that, that could benefit uh, mankind or somehow uh, improve our lives, even if it's, if it's uh, culturally or whatever. Uh, I like to think of the whole process of it getting somewhere uh, beyond just the creative process of innovation. Uh, Andrew Grove, the founder of Intel, said a fundamental rule in technology said that whatever can be done will be done. And there's certainly a lot of problems in the world. And I know you're all, as I understand, graduate students. And so uh, uh, I hope that, that this is true and many of the problems that, that uh, we do have in the world can be solved through, through innovation. Um, so how can we benefit from innovation? Uh, in a variety of ways, of course, uh, greater knowledge. A lot of innovation comes out of the university that, and many universities, and maybe all universities, I would say, uh, that, that improve uh, and increase our level of, of knowledge. Uh, new culture, uh, arts, uh, can certainly be uh, a form of, of innovation. Uh, maybe political solutions, uh, dealing with, with huge political problems. New processes and new products. Uh, those are the kind of things where intellectual property might, might be involved uh, to help improve the economy, uh, developing products and product processes that, that can improve our lives. Focus a little bit on that. Um, economic development. How can we uh, improve uh, the state of our economy and, and improve our lives at the same time? Uh, innovation is a big part of that. If we don't have new ideas, uh, it's, it's very hard to, to, uh, to benefit society. Uh, but you also need other things, like you need enterprise. Uh, for example, uh, companies that can take innovations and move those forward into products that can be used. Uh, you need to enable competition. Companies don't necessarily want to uh, invest a lot into a product uh, if there isn't some way that they can be competitive. Uh, and that really leads to intellectual property. Why does intellectual property, and by inter I'll explain what intellectual property is if, in a broader way if you're not familiar with it. Uh, various types of intellectual property. I'm going to focus on patents, and uh, you're all probably familiar or heard of patents. But there are a variety of, of types of intellectual property that, for the most part, are, are all managed through the US Patent Office, uh, much like patents. There's uh, and I'll talk more about patents later, but there's something called plant variety protection, which is very similar to a patent, where you can protect a sexually uh, reproduced variety of plants. For example, this university has technologies with wheat varieties that are resistant to certain herbicides that are of value in certain parts of, of uh, Montana, certain areas. Uh, and we've licensed those to companies that provide them to, to those farmers that, that need them. Uh, copyrights, familiar with copyrights. Trademarks, I'm, I have no doubt that MSU has trademarked their, their logo there so that they can control the use of that, that logo. Uh, Know-how, we've licensed uh, just the ability that we know how, have the expertise to, to, to be able to do something, which can tie into trade secrets, or a trade secret could even be a recipe. I mean, the classic one is Coca-Cola. A lot of people don't realize a trade secret really requires a lot of due diligence on protecting a secret. Uh, for example, having uh, employee agreements and such to make sure your employee isn't going to walk out with your, with your secret. And if it, the employee does, that, that you can justify or show that you, you really uh, made a strong effort to keep that secret. Uh, so it um, requires a, a a very diligent process. Uh, so what's the importance of intellectual property? I mean, number one, as I mentioned earlier, it empowers competition. Uh, an example of a drug company, and some of the drugs can, can be up to a billion dollars to produce. A company is not going to want to invest in developing a drug at, at that kind of level uh, if they can't have a a certain period of time where they're the only ones that can sell it, where they can have the, the control of the market on that. Uh, 
And then that leads to products that can benefit society, can lead to new companies, jobs. Uh, in terms of universities and universities getting into patent process and intellectual property, can build relationships when we work with companies that are interested in our technology to potentially develop products. Uh, we can end up having sponsored research, university support, serve faculty and students that are interested in, in getting their products out to, uh, to the community, uh, recognition for the university, and then ultimately there can be an income stream coming from licensing of technologies. So talk about a little bit about what is a patent. Uh, simply a, a patent is, is a monopoly, it allows one generally for a 20 year lifetime to sell, use, or make uh, something that they have, have uh, essentially invented and gotten a patent for. So that in return for that, the, the patent office can patent, uh, can publish what you have uh, patented. So you're really allowing the uh, public and the scientific community and the technology community to see what you've done and add to the community uh, pool of knowledge, uh, but you have the control over that uh, use of it. Has to be novel, useful, and not obvious. By, by novel, it has to be essentially something new. It's never been done before. Uh, useful, you cannot patent something uh, like uh, something that would be enable you to counterfeit money, for example, or uh, uh, something that would just uh, you know, be useful for an illicit drug, for example. Uh, but it has to be non-obvious. Somebody uh, that is skilled in the art, uh, somebody who's knowledgeable in the field that you're patenting in, uh, would have to be able to say, well, nobody would have thought of that. It's, it's, a, it's a new and non-obvious idea. And it can't be a, a natural process. Something You can't patent gravity, for example. And uh, that really stems from early on. I, the um, intellectual property is, is um, I think, the only property right that was uh, put into the Constitution, the US Constitution. And Thomas Jefferson was a big advocate of, of democracy, uh, had a lot of uh, skepticism about the patent process, thought that would really uh, not fit the democratic process, that pe companies could have a monopoly on, on things and be unable to, uh, to uh, allow everybody to use it. So he struggled with that. But one thing he did was make sure that things that are just in nature alone uh, couldn't be patented. Now, more recently, there's been a lot of challenges with that when people are doing such things as patenting genes. And, how can you patent a gene It comes from nature? Well, if you've modified it or discovered a particular use for it, something like that, then it can be patentable. So there's a very fine line these days and a lot of controversy over you know, things that come from nature and that are patented. By the way, feel free to interrupt any time if you have any questions. Uh, I do want to just mention one aspect of the patent that, that's crucial. You all probably, as it, whatever your career is, because patents and intellectual property have become such a uh, sort of ubiquitous part of business now, you're probably going to encounter uh, some, some level of, of intellectual property issues. So with patents, novelty is, is an extremely important concept. Uh, around the world, if something has been disclosed uh, outside the US, I mean, the US has a little bit different laws, but uh, there's still a year limit in the U.S. If something has been disclosed through a paper or just discussing it with a uh, an outside, not a colleague, but somebody outside your, your organization, disclosed in any matter is not novel anymore. So one has to be very careful if you have an invention to make sure you go through a process of not disclosing it prior to filing a patent. So you want to file a patent ideally before any kind of public disclosure of a new idea that you think is patentable. Uh, there are ways to protect, uh, other ways to protect the patent. For example, a non-disclosure agreement. You can have an agreement with somebody if you're going to disclose information to them. You can have an agreement that, uh, that that is proprietary information and they're not to share it with anybody else. And if you have the proper non-disclosure agreement, it can still allow you 
to, uh, to go forward with a patent. The material transfer agreement is much the same thing. If you're giving somebody a prototype or a certain bacteria that you want to patent, uh, if you want to protect it properly through a material transfer agreement, again, you can not bar yourself from being able to patent. Laboratory notebooks are extremely critical to uh, being able to, to uh, demonstrate that you were the inventor and sometimes that you were the first inventor. In the US, our laws are currently the first to invent, so sometimes you have to demonstrate you were the first to, inventor, to invent. In the rest of the world, uh, the first to file. Uh, the first one to come to, to a patent office to file a patent uh, has the um, priority. Patents are, have become extremely expensive. Uh, U.S. patent, just the fees alone for a U.S. patent can be $5,000 over the 20-year lifetime of a patent. Uh, but with legal fees and, and uh, processing a patent, typically costs for us for a U.S. patent are in the $35,000 to $50,000 range. So we always look for companies to license the technology and pay for the patent costs because we don't have that kind of money. Foreign patents are $100,000 to $200,000 easily. And uh, it's unfortunate that patents have become that expensive because it's really difficult for startup companies in this area, for example, to, to pay this, these kind of costs. And again, when we license, that's something we look for. And for small companies, it's really the biggest expense of, of, a, of a license. A company, when they license the technology from us, they, they pay an upfront licensing fee. They're going to have a royalty structure. They're going to have minimum annual royalties until they get commercial. But really, the patent cost is what's, what's the killer. So I, if you are all thinking about starting a company, I always try to encourage people to, to try to get something that you can have uh, some kind of product or service that you might be able to do without intellectual property just to get a, a feeling about what it's like to be in, in business, what it's like to have customers, and then start developing maybe your intellectual property once you sort of have, have some income stream uh, going. So uh, it, it, you have to be very careful. It's easy to get sucked up into the patent process because it takes, it can take uh, you know, sometimes easily five, seven years to go through the whole p process of getting a patent. And uh, these costs are incrementally building up. You might start out even at $5,000 for uh, initial provisional patent and then you know, over time, you get up to fifty, hundred thousand dollars, and start wondering why somebody isn't buying or like my product or licensing it. Do I need to keep going, and, and do I sink more money into it? So, the, the cost aspect is critical. So, as I said, you all might uh, and probably will encounter some form of intellectual property. What's happened over time is is the number of patents have increased tremendously. This is looking at it from 1980 to uh, just uh, 2009, the number of patents per year in the US alone have grown to about 200,000 patents per year. And there's a variety of reasons for that. I mean, this is not innovation in itself, but it relates to innovation. Uh, there's certainly a lot of these pat most patents don't end up in products. Uh, most patents uh, uh, are part of the process for somebody to, to develop a product, but the particular patent that leads to, to a product, um, you just don't know if it's going to make it or not. Uh, but, but the amount of patents have grown tremendously, and I think a good example to look at is, is cell phone patents. Um, everybody, all you probably have cell phones. Every cell phone has hundreds of patents probably in them. Uh, for example, and sometimes they may be the same patent on two different cell phones. For example, the camera in a cell phone might be patented. And it may be the same patent in one cell phone as is in another. But the multiple patents are called stacking. And a cell phone uh, has a number of stacked patents. Um, it's just amazing to me. This is actually what I did a search for any kind of patent that had cell phone involved in the patent at any level. Uh, it's not, it could be a, some kind of case for a cell phone or something. I, don't, I didn't really distinguish. But the point is, just a huge exponential increase uh, to 3,500 or so patents a year 
in cell phones. Uh, that's about, uh, I think, 3% or so of all the patents in the US. So that just shows you one innovative product, even though that's not innovation itself, but how it leads to, to huge uh, growth in patents. Um, if you go back, I think the process is um, Martin Cooper in 1974 is, um, was with Motorola. And he is uh, considered to be the inventor of the cell phone. He was the first person to make a phone call on a cell phone. That was in 1974, but the actual technology for cell phones, the innovation of, of the cellular antenna technology was in the early 40s. So it really took from then till 74 for the first cell phone to be developed. But it was a big, plunky cell phone. It wasn't commercial. So it wasn't you know, really until the 90s until you started, started seeing cell phones being used commercially. Interesting enough, from the time that, that Cooper developed, the time that Cooper developed the, or made that first phone call was close to 100 years from when Alexander Graham Bell made the first phone call on, on his telephone. And the, uh, the number of patents, in, so about, it was about, a, I think, only two or three years for, for Bell to have, have a telephone system from, uh, I think, in, in the kinetic, in a regional area of Connecticut. Uh, in the 15 years or so following the invention of Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, I think there were about 15 patents. So look back then, 100 years ago, 15 patents on the telephone to these days where you see 3,000 a year on a cell phone. So for that's a big reason why you just see so many more patents these days. Technology is much more complicated. You know, have you guys ever heard of Cooper? Probably not. Uh, it's uh, most inventions nowadays are, are um, have numerous inventors, numerous can have numerous patents, and are much more complicated. They can, you know, inventors from around the world. If you're familiar with uh, "The World Is Flat" by um, Thomas Friedman, it literally is, you know, a with a knowledge-based economy people working across all kinds of platforms and such to develop technologies, uh, it's, it's a much more complicated process than it used to be. Um, this just shows you just another example of growth in patterns. This is in Palo Alto, which is kind of the heart of Silicon Valley. And again, this is an innovation, but it shows you in an in a area where there is a lot of innovation happening, the kind of growth in patents. And what does it look like in Montana? Well, this is comparing Missoula, Billings, and Bozeman. And pretty well recognized that Bozeman has, has uh, the higher concentration of technology companies, the more technology-based university. It's not Silicon Valley, but it has certainly a strong growth of technology companies. And you see, you can see that represented in, in patents that are issued in this area. And the, the patents coming out of the university is a very small part of this. So this is mostly private industry and, and individual inventors in Bozeman. So can a university own and license a technology? Or how can a university own technology? Back in 1980, prior to 1980, a university could not own technology that came out of federally funded research. And most of our research is funded from federal grants. So what happened back then, uh, technology, there was no incentive. But if somebody did come up with an invention, they had to report it to the government. And the government didn't really know what to do with it. So the, the uh, By Dole Act, Senator By and Senator Dole Act of 1980, allowed universities to own intellectual property. A university then had to develop a process, which we have, where an inventor discloses the fact that they have an invention to our office. And then we decide if we want to 
pursue a patent on that technology. If we do, we disclose this to the government, and if we uh, want to pursue it, uh, then we're really required to do so. So that's recreate, basically required a whole industry in universities uh, to have processes where they can take advantage of what the government is allowing us to do. It's not, not only an opportunity, but a big responsibility to try to get what's developed at a university uh, into patented technology that can benefit society. These are statistics out of the Association of University Technology Managers. They're probably a couple years old, but they have universities all around the country reporting and shows over, this is over the lifetime since Baidol was established in 1980. Over 4,000 products were developed out of university technologies, uh, close to 280,000 jobs, and uh, you know, close to $190 billion in, in US gross domestic product. So our office uh, is involved in protecting and licensing intellectual property, distributing royalties when we have licensed the technology, developing agreements with industry, sponsored research agreements. Uh, generally, when a, when a company wants to sponsor research here, we develop an agreement so that if we develop something, they have the uh, option to license the technology. Uh, we manage other kinds of intellectual property, as I, such as copyrights and plant variety protection. And, we, and we're involved in, in trying to help promote economic development, partly by getting our licenses or our technologies out to local companies, but also by trying to facilitate uh, grant processes, collaboration between university researchers and uh, companies. So what does it look for? What is the number of licenses look like for our university. It's really proportionate to some extent to the growth of research. Since uh, early 1980, we were under $20 million a year in research expenditures. Uh, and now we're up in the $100 million range. The more research we have, the more opportunities we have to have uh, inventions. And we've seen, this is looking at uh, the number of of patents that have issued, MSU patents, and then the number of licenses to where we're hitting over 40 or so licenses or options on our technologies a year now. Uh, about the year 2000, we brought uh, the operation, uh, the intellectual property operation onto campus, and we've seen that, that growth. Uh, this is a particular technology, just to give you an example of the kinds of technologies that can come out of the university, this is panic grass growing around a hot springs in Yellowstone Park. And some university, some, some of our researchers at this university collaborating with some USGS uh, researchers, US Geological Survey, wanted to know why this grass could grow in a very uh, dry and, and very hot area, and uh, thought if they could understand that process, maybe they could develop a process where, where uh, agricultural plants or ornamental plants or golf courses could survive in, uh, in stress environments. And so what they did was they did a lot of investigation on the plant, and they found this one fungi it's called curvularia growing on that plant. and they. Uh, did studies where they looked at the plant with and without that fungi growing on it. And it turned out if the fungi is growing on it, the plant can withstand a certain level of drought and a certain level of heat. If you add the, if you don't have the, the fungi, it can't survive it. They then applied this fungi on other kinds of plants, like tomatoes, and found that they could get tomatoes to grow in a more, in a higher drought environment, a drier environment. In a, in a higher temperature environment. Now this is a plant coming from Yellowstone Park, so it required uh, collaboration with the park and permitting from the park uh, as part of the process. So there's three, just to show you how complicated this is, three agencies, two agencies of the government, the USGS and the Yellowstone Park, and then MSU, all collaborating to file this as a patent, and then ultimately we licensed it to a company that is now developing it 
for a uh, commercial product, trying to figure out how to get this, uh, to get that fungi to grow on a seed as a seed coating on agricultural plants. And then as the plants grow, they would have this kind of uh, uh, stress tolerance. So how can all this licensing and, and innovation at the university help in terms of economic development in our community? Well, I talked about our technology office. 60% of our, our patents have gone to local companies. We've, been, we've seen about 40 startup companies with students graduating from here or faculty starting up companies. There's other organizations on campus. Uh, TechLink is one example, which is an organization sponsored by the Department of Defense that licenses DOD technologies, facilitates the licensing of DOD technologies. They actually have a larger staff than we have in our office because DOD has about 700 patents a year. Uh, they've been responsible for uh, bringing technologies to Montana companies uh, that have produced uh, 70 over $70 million in revenues, 600 jobs in those companies. They helped start the local business incubator, Tech Ranch, which has produced 100 companies and resulted in 300 jobs. There's also Montana Manufacturing Extension Center on campus here that has been involved in 1,300 projects around the state with 600 companies, resulting in increased uh, sales of 35 million or retained sales and, and 300, over 300 new and retained jobs. So all this uh, leads to, uh, well, another component I was asked to talk about was, was SBRs. In Montana, we don't have a lot. We don't have venture capital. We don't, it's, it's challenging to get uh, revenues to start companies, but there is one opportunity that the government provides, which is under the Small Business Innovative Research Program, SBIR, which was started in 1982. And one and a quarter percent of these major uh, government agencies, uh, one and a quarter percent of their funding goes into a program which puts out uh, requests for proposals for small companies to apply for grants very similar to university grants. Uh, and those can be in collaboration with universities too. In fact, it helps tremendously to collaborate with the university to get an SBIR grant. An SBIR grant is done in phases. Phase one is generally $100,000. Phase two, generally $500,000 or more. So in Montana, Montana companies have received, since, since the SBIR program started, $122 million uh, in funding. Uh, MSU TechLink has assisted with about $40 million of that, and $65 million of SBIR funding has gone to, to local companies. So it's really helped uh, initiate the tech development in this area. So all this kind of leads to kind of critical mass funding for startup companies in our area, technology coming from the university or being developed at these companies, uh, assistance, there's a variety of assistance for people to start up companies and grow companies. One example is uh, the optics industry in this area. It's probably the strongest concentration of, of one technology sector in this area. In the mid 80s, several uh, graduate students coming out of uh, physics were complaining to, to so, so faculty members that they couldn't get any jobs here. And at that time, there really weren't a lot of small companies here or a lot of job opportunities. And so they collaborated with, their, with the, uh, the faculty members to develop a program called Optech, which is an organization to help foster relationships between university faculty and Optech companies. And these are the number of companies over time that have grown out of, of that uh, collaboration. Um, more recently, some of the uh, interesting companies that we've seen is Bridger Photonics is, is a company that's growing tremendously and is probably the world's leader in using laser or LADAR technology for precise measurements. 
uh, very fine measurements which could end up, for example, uh, allowing uh, much finer machine of car parts and ending up with much more uh, efficient engines, for example. So I think they're a company that's, that's really going to take off here in Bozeman. Uh, NWB Sensors is one of our most recent spin-out companies from the university where a couple of, of graduate students uh, working in calibration system for calibrating infrared cameras uh, licensed the technology that they really had helped develop here at the university and have spun that out and have started a company and they within their first year they already have some sales. Hey Nick, are any of those public companies? Are any of the, so the companies that we've uh, there. Uh, I don't think so. I'm trying to think one of the I can't think of it now. Um, I go back. Whoops. The wrong way. I don't see them on it. Scientific Materials was sold to FLIR. They may be a public company, but um, I can't see any that, to my knowledge, are a public company. Thank you. Uh, recently, the uh, the Bureau of uh, Business and Economic Research, which is based in Missoula, every year they go around the state and give uh, presentations on the economic state of particular areas. And they came here recently to talk about Gallatin County. And Paul Polson, who heads up that that research group, uh, gave these statistics of non-farm labor income and showed you know, with the economic downfall last year how we had a, a negative growth in, in uh, labor income. He projected this year a 3% growth rate and up into 4% in the coming years. And he said the only reason he could show this growth rate was because of the strength of the technology sector in Bozeman. So it really shows how what, what's developed since the 80s here has really helped stabilize this economy and uh, provide a lot of opportunity. So I just kind of leave you with some thoughts on how you might uh, think about how you can innovate as you uh, move on to your career. Um, this is out of Scott Birkin's the, the Myths of Innovation, but he distilled down seven habits of highly innovative people as he saw them. Being persistent, um, and there's a quote from Thomas Edison, obviously a, an appropriate uh, person to quote on inventions. Invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Um, and I've really seen at the university here where people have developed innovative programs, they've really had to fight hard and for many years. And, and I really think persistence is, is definitely a, a huge part of the process. Um, don't limit yourself. Don't, I think, just have to um, think as broadly as possible. Take risks. Make mistakes. Again, a quote from Edison, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Um, allow yourself time to, to think and let your mind wander. Writing things down. Um, of course, in the patent process, is critical as I mentioned having lab notebooks, but just writing things down and keeping a diary to, to help you in your process of, of innovating and finding patterns and create combinations. And I think so observation is probably one of the most critical components to, to uh, innovation and then curiosity. Um, you need to have a curious mind to innovate and hopefully all of you will be great innovators and help lead to uh, great solutions. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Well, I guess. So all the students in here are guide students? Excellent. And you're all going to want to start your own businesses when you graduate? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like
Well, I was asked to come talk about how I started a business. But after listening to Nick's presentation, I thought, holy crap, I know a lot about the patent side too. There's, there is the good side of patenting, and then there's the dark side of patenting. And there is a lot of evil that goes on in patenting. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a fun and wild ride when you start trying to patent things. And, and you learn phrases like, for those schooled in the art of. And it, they're just right with that. Try to read a patent application sometime. It's, it's not in English. They may be English words, but they're not constructed so that anyone normal could actually understand them. <laughs> and that, that's why the costs are big, big money, because you have to hire a patent attorney or intellectual property attorneys. I only know of one in the state of Montana. She's in Billings, which I noticed that not very many patents came out of Billings, and I thought that was kind of ironic. But. Most of those were like you know, obscure parts that would go on a tractor or something. Oh, yeah. And the stuff that makes the guy that invented it uh, an instant millionaire. Yeah. But it's weird. <laughs> the guy who invents the zip tie or, or the little cup holder thing. Instant millionaire. But the guy who invents TV, he dies in obscurity. You know, it's just weird. <laughs> but, you know, we, we uh, there's a couple of strategies for patents. I mean, one of the strategy that was talked about today was, um, we call it the sword or the shield. The sword is the, is the idea where you're going to have a patent and you're going to go make money on your patent. The other idea, or the flip side, is because it's such a highly litigious society and the fact that so many people want to rush to patent everything, you have to protect yourself, just even stay in business. And that's the strategy I've adopted as a businessman. We have patents and uh, trade secrets and copyright and all of those. But ours are all around the idea of just protecting our ability to continue to do business. So that if somebody else goes out and gets a patent for what we do, because duplicate patents do exist, and you know, their patent examiners are in incredibly overwhelmed with the 400,000 new patents that are issued every year or whatever. There's scads more that are being applied for, and there's only like two patent examiners. No, okay, there's maybe a few more, but <laughs> these guys, they don't look at everything. And they'll issue patents that are the duplicate of something else. And then if somebody who's a sword kind of guy gets that patent, He'll start going after every company that's doing the things that he thinks infringes on his patent. He'll issue, you know, strong letters saying cease and desist and pay me lots of money to continue. And if you don't have a protection of some kind, you can end up in protracted lawsuits that cost, if, if you think 50000 for a patent's a lot, protecting your right to stay in business is probably an order of magnitude more than you can spend five million dollars on a lawsuit trying to overturn a patent or protect your right to continue in your business. And we face those types of uh, things all the time. And fortunately, in technology, a lot of times it's easy to come up with a workaround that doesn't use their super secret way of doing things. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, it's been an interesting ride. I, my name is Chris Nelson. I'm the founder of a company called Zoot Enterprises, and Zoot helps large financial institutions instantly approve credit. So for example, if you've gone to a Bank of America or Wells Fargo or even a First Interstate, applied for any type of loan, they'll send your information to us, we'll go up and pull the appropriate data, score it, calculate, and then come up with an answer that says yes or no, and we'll send that back to the institution and you'll be approved or declined. We uh, started, you know, a little bit from humble beginnings, I guess. I was, uh, I first, after college, not being able to get a real job, I became an uh, independent computer consultant, and I started the name Zoot Enterprises, Inc., because that sounds better, you know, it's incorporated. <laughs> and I said, independent computer consultant. I had a bunch of cards printed up. And I went around and started handing them out, and I did lots of consulting work, and this was back in 1985, so I was helping people build computers and do accounting systems and all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, of 
course, I showed my dad my business card. My dad looked at it and he said, consultant? Isn't that just a fancy term for unemployed? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so I uh, started working on that. And then I got a real job working for First Bank Systems. I was the systems analyst for the state of Montana and got the great opportunity to automate virtually all of the different business departments in the bank. Because back in 1985-86, those were the days of the mainframe and the personal computer had just really started to come out. So, you know, we were working on things like the 8088 chip and then, of course, the super speedy 8086 chip, which all the clone computers used. And then, then, you know, right about that time, the 80286 chip came out, which was just amazing. Which now today, you know, even my car has more processing power than an 80286 chip. But anyway, uh, I got the chance to automate things like wire transfer, which was so cool. A little bit to them, a little bit to them, a little bit to me, a little bit to them, a little bit to them, a little bit to me. You know, it was a lot of fun to get to see the inner workings of how a bank does all of its stuff. I, uh, I have two degrees, one in accounting, one in computers. And uh, going to work for a bank, of course, is a revolution. In accounting, debits are positive and credits are negative. In banking, it's reversed. So I had to reverse all of my knowledge when I went to work for a real company. But uh, the school will do that to you. I mean, you learn all this stuff and then you go into the real world and they do just the opposite. <laughs> but they, uh, I got the chance to do check conciliation, uh, investment services, just all the different things within banking, which was a great marriage between accounting and computer stuff. And I'd been there about three years, and I got a phone call from a company in Bozeman named CFI Banker Service Group. And CFI wrote software that would allow people to print loan documentation on a laser printer, which this was 1988, and that was revolutionary. Before then, you'd use those five-part forms, and if it wasn't automated, you'd use, you know, physical strike typewriter, type really hard on the keys, so go through all five copies. <laughs> and uh, with the laser printer, it was really cool because it could just print five copies. And it was amazingly nice looking, and it was really cool. And people didn't have to have this huge inventory of forms and all of that. For banks, it was kind of a game changer. But uh, CFI had made me an offer. They, they only dealt with banks, and none of their employees had ever worked for a bank. So they didn't know how to talk to their customers, and especially their technology folks. How many of you guys are like technology folks? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we have somewhat of a gap sometimes talking to normal people. You know, we have to kind of learn to explain things a little bit more slowly in, in smaller words, you know, so that they can understand. But uh, a lot of times um, there's an even wider gap if you don't understand the business that you're trying to serve, every business comes up with all of their own own names for everything, own acronyms for everything. You know, it's DDA, those types of things. DDA, direct deposit accounts, that kind of stuff. If you don't know that language, then they won't take you seriously. And you know, if you're trying to make your living from them, it's kind of nice to know their language. So I got the opportunity to come to work for CFI Banker Service Group, and. Uh, I'd been a single parent since my son was two, and he was about uh, seven or eight at this time. And we were living in Billings, loving Billings. Never thought I'd leave. Got this offer from CFI because they said, oh, "Come on up. We're really laid back. We've got flex hours. You know, we're just really casual." Oh, this sounds really good. Because working in a bank, you have to wear three-piece suits, and you know, you work early in the morning to late at night on weekends. And I thought, "Oh, this will be great." I'll be able to take my son to school in the morning. I'll be able to wear jeans to work. This will be awesome. So I quit my job and we're, you know, moved to Beverly. And anyway, moved up to Bozeman. It was the winter of 89, which was the uh, coldest winter on record in Bozeman. It was 40 below zero for two straight weeks right after we moved up. And we were renting this um, basement apartment at the top of Sipes Canyon. And, uh, <laughs> All the businesses in town closed, so we couldn't do anything, couldn't go to work, couldn't do anything except for sit and look at each other all morning, or all day long in this little tiny basement apartment. And uh, 
I was working on Sean quite a bit at the time, because we lived in Billings, you know, because Billings is the big city in Montana. And you have to lock your car, and you have to lock your house, and all that kind of stuff. And so, growing up, I've always been very careful to say, Sean, lock the door, lock the car, blah, blah, blah. Well, during this two-week period, when it was so cold, we got a little bit of, you know, stir-crazy within that little log cabin in the basement. So I said, well, let's go to dinner. And it was Taco Tuesday at Taco John's, two tacos for a dollar. So we drive to Taco John's, and I wanted to leave the truck running because it was so cold. I was scared to turn it off, actually. And uh, I said, Sean, wait in the car. He's like, OK. So I go in, and there's this big, long line. And it takes forever. 20 minutes go by. Pretty soon, Sean comes running in. And uh, I'm like, Sean, what are you doing? He's like, well, let's take this along. I'm like, well, the line's really long. And all of a sudden, I got this tight gut. <laughs> Hey, Sean, did you lock the car? He says, yeah. <laughs> said, did you happen to turn it off and take the keys out? He said, no. Oh, my God. So fortunately, back then, you could call the police, and they'd come and lock your car. That's how we got to know the police so well in this town. Anyway, uh, so we uh, got to know Bozeman pretty well. But as I was settling into my new job, after about a week, I got called into the boss's office, and he said, Geez, I noticed you've been coming to work at 8.30 every day. I said, yeah, I, I love these flex hours. I've been able to take my son to school. It's really nice. He says, well, the rest of us are getting here earlier, and you're bringing morale down. <laughs> OK. So I started coming to work at 7.30. And another week went by, and I got called into his office. And he said, hey, we've been noticing you've been wearing jeans to work every day. Like, yeah, I really like this casual atmosphere here. And, my computer doesn't care. He said, well, the rest of us dress nicer, and you're bringing morale down. <laughs> so I started wearing suits again. I hated working there. After about a year, I was uh, working on a project for CUNA, the Credit Union National Association. They came out to visit. And one of the guys said, hey, does anyone want an after hours programming job? And I raised my hand. And he said, great. We need someone that will write a program that will pull credit reports on a PC. I said, I could do that piece of cake. Only I didn't know anything about it. But as soon as I had negotiated enough to live for six months, I quit my job and went to work out of the basement of my house so I could wear jeans to work every day and take my son to school. And then the better part was I could go pick him up after school and I could watch Star Trek with him every day <laughs> at 4 o'clock. But uh, because I didn't know anything about credit reports, I wrote this tool that would allow anyone to define any data source out there. And they could send up any kind of type of data string to it, get back a blob of data, and then use a word processor-like thing that I wrote and create reports from it. And they could do math and logic and all that kind of great stuff. And you know, for programmers, you know, the worst part of programming is creating the reports because. You'll work really hard, you'll make it look really pretty and nice, and then you'll hand it to the client and they'll go, oh, this looks great. Can you move the page number three spaces to the left? Can you make the title this? And can you do that? It's like, yeah. But it's still done. It's like, oh. So then you work on that, and they go, oh, this looks great. Can you do this? Can you do that? It's like, yes. So I wanted to make it so that they did that work. <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, finished the project, and I installed the code. We sent it out to about 4,000 credit unions around the country. And all it did back then was go out, pull a credit report, and format it, and make it look really pretty. <coughs> and about that time, of course, I started to realize that I'd only negotiated enough money to live for six months, and I'd used five of those months up, you know, just writing all the stuff. And uh, so I started calling all the banks that I worked with. Came across the bank in Arizona called Valley National Bank. And they were a lead technology bank. You know, they were into anything that would automate was great. So they were the first to do um, imaging and all this kind of stuff. And I called them up and said, hey, what do you guys do to pull credit reports? And they said, oh, we use these teletype terminals. And you know, you guys are all so young, you probably don't remember these. But it used to be that when you wanted to communicate with the mainframe, you could do it in one of two ways. One is you'd have this really elaborate setup so that a CRT could dial into a mainframe. Or you'd have a teletype terminal, which was a printer and a keyboard all in one. And you'd type in cryptic stuff and hit the send button, and it would go up and communicate and then bring back stuff and print it out. 
And that's how banks and other people pulled credit reports back in the old days. And uh, so that's how they were doing it. And so when they'd have somebody come in and apply for a loan, they'd key in this cryptic little sequence, pull a credit report, then they'd print it out and they'd circle the things they'd like and underline the things they didn't like, and then they'd ask the guy's tie color and make a loan decision. So it was uh, all very automated and straightforward back then. But that process would typically take a month. It would take forever for them to approve a loan. Well, Dali had come up with this idea that they wanted to be able to approve a loan in 15 minutes. And that was unheard of back then. And so they licensed the software for me, which was great because we'd run out of money. And getting a license to be in meant we got to eat for a while longer. And uh, we automated that whole process for them so that if somebody called up or came in, all they had to do is type in the name, address, and social of the person. The system would go out, pull the appropriate data, bring it back, calculate attributes, run through rule sets, and then either approve or decline the application. And this got a lot of attention back then. And uh, specifically, American Express just happened to be Valley's next door neighbor in Phoenix. And so they called Valley and said, how are you guys doing this loan and loan stuff? And Valley said, oh, we're using this little company called Zoo. So I got a phone call from American Express Corporate Card. And they said, hey, we have these take one applications that we put out all over the country in restaurants, bookstores, everywhere. People fill them out, mail them in. We key them into one system. We pull a credit report. We key out the data from that. And we calculate the score by hand. And we do this, that, and the other thing. And eight weeks later, we give them an answer. And we'd like to automate that process. So of course, I said, oh, I could do that piece of cake. So we went in and automated the entire process of credit approval for American Express corporate card. And we called the project eight weeks to eight seconds, because that's how much we were able to compress the timeline for them. And uh, we made it so that everything was automatic. As soon as you typed in the name, address, so she would go out and get the credit report, calculate the attributes, <coughs> calculate their super secret scores, say yes or no. If it was a yes, then it would populate all the back-end systems, order the plastic to be printed, and book the accounts on the, uh, on the uh, loan servicing service centers, uh, and do all of the great things that it had to do. And if it was negative, then it would print out a declination letter that would say, dear deadbeat, please don't ever apply again, and go away. And uh, so that got a lot of attention for Zoo, and we just kept growing from there. You know, and over the years, we've um, grown from that to today, where last year we uh, decisioned 240 million loan applications, all automated. Our average time for processing an account is about three seconds or less. So we go out and gather all the data, do all the decision, and send back an answer all within that three seconds. And over the years, we've done everything from credit card, mortgage, home equity, personal lines and loans, auto loans, student loans, casket sales, and everything in between. And it's been a fun ride, that's for sure. But it was, it was a long road, and it chokes me up to talk about it. <clears throat> it was one of the there were some really pivotal moments in the life of Zoo. <coughs> One of the phrases that I that I loved for more than half my life now is one by the the, uh, the business guru Anthony Robbins, the king of pop psychology. One of his his phrases was, "People tend to overestimate what they can do in a year, but they completely underestimate what they can do in ten." And one of the things that I believed in and seen all my life is that people will have these great ideas. And they'll chart it out, do a business case, and they'll be showing, oh yeah, I'm going to lose money in the first month. And then by month two, I'm going to break even. And by the end of the year, I'm making a million dollars a year. And by year five, I'm selling the company for a billion dollars. Do you want to invest in that? <laughs> <I'm> like, no. <laughs> But we do. We fall in love with our ideas, and we see all, all of the potentials. And because we can visualize it in our minds, it's done. But we tend to forget that there's a lot of work to do between starting it, break even, and making money. And it takes a long time, and it takes a lot of effort. 
And so a lot of people will give up after a year because they haven't made their million dollars in a year or hit their targets. And then they'll go start something else and then they'll give up on that. And then they'll start something else and give up on that. And one of the other concepts that I believe in a lot is that to become a master at what you do or to become really good at what you do, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of practice. You know, repetition is the mother of skill. Well, I think a lot of people get impatient with that skill building time. And they'll go so far in a career, and just when they start to gain some mastery over it, they'll get tired of it, or they'll hit some walls, and they'll go start something else and start over again and continually spend a lot of time of their life always building skill instead of getting to the point to where they can master that skill. And what really stood out for me is 10 years ago, we had our 10th anniversary for Zoo. And we rented out Bridger Bowl, it was in September, and we got their brand new um, Deer Park Chalet. Rented that whole thing out, had a band, and we had like 200 people there. I think we had about 100 employees at the time. And uh, I gave a big speech, and you know, it was really motivational. People cried, they laughed, you know, they wanted autographs afterwards. It was just a great time. And I, you know, gave the speech of, you know, people tend to overestimate what they can do a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 and look at what we've done in 10 years. And we were all just psyched because 10 years ago, we had like conquered the world. And it was, so I gave my speech of, think about what we can do in the next 10 years. And since Zoot's coming up on its 20th anniversary this September, I've been thinking a lot about that, you know, I'm getting nostalgic and thinking about the good old days and stuff like that. Thinking about how far we've come in those 10 years and how much further we can go in the next 10 years. And it gets really exciting, but it's really hard and it never gets any easier. It's weird, you know, I, same problems I wrestled with when I was starting the company are virtually the same problems I wrestle with today. You know, cash flow, motivation of employees, getting people to do what they say they're going to do, when they say they're going to do it, keeping our word to our customers. All of those things have not changed, and it's really weird. Because all those are the things that suck. <laughs> no. Oh, wait. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's been an interesting road, too. I, you know, I, I've always been, I like to call myself a farmer. You know, that I, I wasn't really raised on a farm, but I worked on a farm when I was a kid up until I was 19. And uh, learned a lot from the farmer mentality, which is you pay cash, you don't get debt. If it's broken, you fix it. If you can build it, build it, because it's a lot cheaper to build it yourself than to buy it from somebody else. And you make do with what you have, and you do the very best with the tools that you have to get the very best results that you can. And sometimes all your hard work is going to result in failure. And another great sentence that I've held on to from the great guru Anthony Robbins is, failure is data. It's not a judgment on you or anything that you're doing. Failure is just data. And it was one of Edison's quotes up there. He didn't fail 10,000 times inventing the light bulb. He just figured out 10,000 ways not to do it. Failure is just data. And if you can remove the emotion and the judgment and the bad feelings about failure, you can learn a lot from not succeeding all the time. In fact, I think that's the best lesson sometimes, or the hard lessons. And, you know, I've never been a gambler. I, you know, the most I've ever won in Las Vegas was 15 bucks that I found on the sidewalk. <laughs> and I don't believe in easy gains or easy wins. They don't happen very often. And when they do happen to people, people aren't ready for them. And, you know, the success that we've had to build was slow and steady, just like a farm would be. And I've always taken that attitude that, you know, if it's going to take bailing wire and twine to make this thing work, great. Let's get her done. Let's get it into production. Let's make it go. And one of the barriers that I see for a lot of people is, especially programmers, we've got all of these problems we've got to worry about, but is we'll tend to want to make it 
an academic exercise and make it perfect and make it fit all sizes. And we forget that there's just really a job that we need it to do. So you'll find programmers will go off and solve all the problems of the entire world and their stuff will never actually get into production because it's over budget, over time, and it doesn't work. When if they would have just focused on the needs at hand and kept their focus on getting the job done, they would have had it done in a lot less time, they would have pleased the customer, and they would have been able to move on. And since I've always been kind of a farmer and like duct tape and twine, I've been able to do a lot of that. And I see a lot of people not able to get past that barrier of just getting it done. I mean, sometimes the words minimum sufficient are gold. Because, you know, we all want quality. We all want the best of the best of the best. But in the real world, minimum sufficient sometimes is, is the best of the best. If you try to make it absolutely perfect, you'll never get there. And in the real world, when you actually have to go out and earn money, you have to have a client pay you for something, you can't keep telling him two more weeks. Sometimes you gotta deliver what you got and make it work, make it be minimum sufficient. Otherwise, they'll be waiting forever for perfect and they'll never use your stuff. And that's why versioning of software is so important. <laughs> well, we, uh, I don't know, I've, I've seen a lot of people want to start businesses, and I think that there's so many, so many paths that you can take to get it done. <coughs> One path is to drop a business plan that's super cool and has a lot of sex appeal, go out to all the venture capitalists and angel investors and all of that, trying to raise money and try and go that route. And that's a route to go, but it's about as safe a route as just taking your money and putting it in the lottery. I mean, people spend a lot of time raising money, especially when you go that route, when you could actually just be out there doing the work and getting customers and making them. People do it and they succeed, but it's rare. I think there's other routes to go, which are get a loan. Get a loan from your friends, from your parents, from the Small Business Administration, and that's a route to go too. But if you've got to pay them back, then you're working for them for a long time to come. And if you have a dip in your revenues, they may end up owning your company. Jeez, if your parents foreclose on you, I mean, that's a hard road to take. Come on, Dad, back off. The way that, you know, is the safest road to take is find a customer that will pay you to do what you're going to do. That's what I did, is I had a first customer that said, I'll pay you enough to live for six months. And I was careful in that I owned the rights to the intellectual property, and I just licensed them the software. I gave them broad licenses because they were the first customer, and I gave them things that I would have never given a second customer. But they got us off the ground. And I developed a really close relationship with them. When we started to get to a point to where I had to create a processing center because we couldn't license our software anymore because we had to run the transactions ourselves, I had to buy a super cool computer. Uh, and I was you know, a big believer in IBM back then you know, because I worked in a bank. And the saying back then is if you buy blue, you never have to worry and that kind of stuff. It used to be that if you bought IBM, you know, nobody would ever fire you for doing that. If you bought something else and it didn't work, you could lose your job. So I was kind of growing up in that environment and all of my customers were banks, so I wanted to get an IBM, but I was a Unix geek, so I wanted to get a Unix box. And they'd just come out with this RS6000 line of computers, which was super cool stuff because they had the RISC chip technology. It was way faster than the Intel technology at the time. And so anyway, I uh, flipped through the catalog and found the one that I wanted. And uh, it was amazing for specs and all that kind of stuff. The only unfortunate part was that it cost 150,000 bucks. <laughs> it was like, you know, that might as well have been 10 million at the time. And so I went to every <coughs> bank in town with my business plan and I got turned down at every bank in town. And I, you know, called my parents and they didn't have that kind of money. And anyway, so. I went back to CUNA and I said, hey, have I got this great idea for you. I'm going to port my code to Unix and run it in a processing environment. And you guys are really going to benefit from all this. 
And we're like, oh yeah, this sounds really cool. What's the catch? And they said, well, can I borrow $150,000? They said, sure, but we need some collateral. And I'm like, well, we can put the computer up. They're like, no, computers are like worthless after a year, so we want your son. <laughs> okay. So I had to put Sean up as my collateral. So anyway, I signed the papers and all that kind of stuff. I ordered the machine. At the same time, we were trying to get um, Bank of America off the ground. They were going to be our first customer on our processing system. And Bank of America at that time was just this militant bank. When they did a project, it ran on schedule, on time, under budget. And if any of those criteria failed, whoever made it fail just disappeared. You know, <laughs> never did. Yeah. And uh, so we were trying to port all of our code at this time from DOS over to Unix. And so I borrowed some machines from the local IBM rep, telling them I needed to try them out and see if I really liked them and all that kind of stuff. And meanwhile, I ordered this machine. And I ported all my code. And it was running on these two little boxes. And every week, the IBM rep would come over and be like, can I have my machines back? Because I've got other customers that would like to demo those. And I'd be like, well, ah, I need to run some more tests on them. I'm not sure. Can you come back next week? And be like, OK. This went on for like three months. <laughs> he was getting cranky towards the end. But anyway, so I ported all my code over to these machines. And I got all the stuff running. And we laid dedicated lines to Bank of America and to the three major credit reporting agencies, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. Only back then it was CDI, TransUnion, and TRW. And uh, got everything running on these test boxes, but the clock was ticking and I was starting to get really nervous. And we got down to about two weeks before the uh, Bank of America project was supposed to go live. It was Friday night, 5 o'clock, and this truck rolls up in the parking lot. Big trucker comes in and he says, Hey, I got a delivery for you. Can I have some guys come up and help me unload it? I'm like, oh, I bet it's our computer. How many guys you need? He says, Well, like five or six. And I'm thinking, five or six for a computer? <laughs> come on. Anyway, we grab everybody that's standing around. We go up and it's this huge box. I mean, it's the size of a refrigerator, it weighs 600 pounds. And all he's got is this wobbly dolly. And so we lift it up and we're starting to walk it down the ramp off the truck and it almost slips off. And, I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I've mortgaged my son for this. <laughs> Let's get it inside. So we get it inside, take all the boxes off. And back in the old days when you bought computers, you got a bunch of books with them. And when you bought a $150,000 computer, you got a stack of books that was like this tall, which is like the, whole, the coolest part of buying a computer. You know I mean, it was just <laughs> awesome. So uh, we get everything out, and I take the plug out, and I look at the wall. And I look at the plug, and the plug had three prongs on it. <laughs> what the heck is this? Somebody goes, boy, I think that's a 220 volt plug. -in. I'm like, who would make a computer with 220 volts? What the heck is this? So we look around. There are no 220 volt plug-ins in the office. So about 8 o'clock Friday night in Bozeman, I start calling all the electricians in the yellow pages. <laughs> Do you know how many electricians in Bozeman like to work Friday nights at 8 o'clock in Bozeman? <laughs> Like, none. Anyway, I found this guy. He had special rates for after hours installations. <laughs> Agreed to pay it because I was pretty nervous about this timeline ticket. He came in, put it all in. We got it plugged in, turned the big red switch on, watched the monitor. The only thing that this big machine had for any indication was it had a three digit LED display, and numbers would start rolling on it. And it did that for like five minutes. And then it stopped on three eighths. I'm thinking, jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> Only nothing came up on the you know, terminal. So I start looking through the books, and I find the one with the error codes in it. And I find three eighths, and it says, system halted. <laughs> that was helpful. So I find the support number, and I call up IBM support. It's getting to be about midnight now. And, uh, they say, where are you at? And I said, I'm in Bozeman, Montana. And they go, oh, Bozeman, OK, Bozeman. Oh, Bozeman, we only support Bozeman Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. I'm like, well, yeah, but you don't understand. I'm doing this project for Bank of America. People disappear. I don't want to die. Let's get this done. <laughs> and they, uh, 
They say, oh, well, we have special after hours rates if you'd like to pay that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. So they get me to this guy. He says, what's the problem? I tell him, we just got this brand new machine, it's fired it up, three eights, it's not working. He goes, oh, yeah, system halted. <laughs> yeah, I know. So how do I make it not halted? <laughs> he goes, oh, I don't know. He said, I'll have to dispatch support. I'm like, okay, what time will they be here tomorrow? He goes, oh, you live in Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> They'll be there Monday morning at 8 o'clock. I'm like, no, 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 no. We got two whole days before Monday morning at 8 o'clock. Let's get them down here tomorrow. And he says, no, they don't work on weekends. Like, oh. <laughs> so I wait till Monday. Monday, IBM guy comes in about 8 o'clock. And he brings in his bag full of stuff, and he starts taking everything apart. He starts swapping parts out, making phone calls, getting more stuff flown in. Monday goes by, Tuesday goes by, Wednesday goes by, Thursday goes by, Friday. He comes into my office in the afternoon, he's like, I don't know what's wrong with it, I can't make it work. I'm like, what? Aren't you guys trained in this? He says, well, actually, no. He said, that machine you've got, you've got the second one that IBM made. So we are trained in this stuff, so we're gonna have to fly some people in. I'm like, okay, can they be here tomorrow at eight? He goes, oh no, tomorrow's Saturday. They'll be here Monday morning at eight. I'm like, I got one week left, this has got to be right. It's like, well, we'll fly the guys in from Salt Lake City, don't worry. So Monday morning, eight o'clock, two guys from Salt Lake City show up. And they do the same dance. Replacing parts, making phone calls, ordering stuff in. Monday goes by, Tuesday goes by, Wednesday goes by, Thursday goes by. Friday afternoon, 5 o'clock, they walk into my office and they're finally smiling and they're like, we got it fixed. I'm like, cool, what was it? And they're like, oh, it's the last thing we ever thought to check. Well, obviously. <laughs> oh, it's some memory part that, you know, we would have never thought could have gone bad and it was bad, we replaced it and all works now. He says, but you know, we replaced every single component in our machine, so you have a brand new machine now. <laughs> it was brand new when I got it off the truck last week. <laughs> so they go home, it's Friday night, 6 o'clock, we're supposed to go live with Bank of America Monday morning. So I stay and I start moving the code over, and I run a couple tests, and it's fast. And then I start moving the bureau lines over, and I start pulling some test credit reports. And it just rocks. I mean, I'm starting to feel so much better because this thing is so fast. And uh, last thing I got to do, and it's getting close to midnight, is move Bank of America slide over. And it, this is when we used uh, SNA protocol on the SDL SDLC cards, and the big clunky cables with ends that were this huge, you know, and they're really heavy, and you have to move them around. So I unplug it from the one machine, and I plug it in back of this big new machine and uh, get everything up and running and it looks golden and I'm finally just all the stress is starting to lose away and I'm starting to feel comfortable. And the phone rings. And I'm thinking, who's calling me at midnight? I answer the phone and it's this guy who has a very, very heavy Indian accent and I, he's screaming at me and I can't understand him except for something about Bank of America and network support. I kind of get that out of it. I ask him to calm down, speak a little slower, and I can't understand. Could you talk a little slower? And finally get out of him that he's calling from Bank of America network support. And he says, did you do anything? Did you do anything different? I'm thinking, no. I didn't change my application at all. I didn't change any of my code. Everything's the same as it was yesterday, as the day before. It's all the same. He says, are you sure you didn't do anything different? He says, well, I brought up another computer, but that shouldn't have any effect. He said, well, whatever you did, just brought down the entire network for Bank of America. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to plug everything, plug them back into the two little test boxes, and that's what we went live with, with Bank of America, which was really funny, because like, just after we went live, the guy who was head of all of credit risk management for Bank of America flew up to Bozeman to come meet us, you know, check out suit and all that kind of stuff. He gets to my office at like about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we were just renting this couple little offices from Morrison, Merrily over in Tech Park. And my computer room was this big walk-in closet. 
where the two little machines were processing all of Bank of America's credit processing stuff. And we chat for a while and kind of run out of things to say. You know, and he says, hey, can I have a tour of your computer room? I'm like, sure. sure. <laughs> we get out across the hall, open up the closet door. He walks in. He looks down, sees the two little boxes. He turns sheet white. He turns around to me and he says, let's go to dinner. I'm like, sure. <laughs> so uh, we finally uh, figured out what, what, what caused it was not only did I get the newest machine that IBM made, but I got the newest version of SNA, which was the communications protocol. And my version of SNA told Bank of America's version of SNA to go die a horrible death. And it did. <laughs> So we went back to the older version of SNA on that new machine, and I was able to bring it out, which was really cool. But then uh, we were processing, oh, about 2,000 transactions a day with Bank of America at that time, which was really cool, because before that time, my business model had been to charge either a license fee or some time and materials to get things configured to make it work their way. And uh, with this new processing environment, it was able to charge them by the transaction. So instead of having to resell myself all the time, I just got recurring revenue. And so I programmed a little cash register sound on the computer so that every time a transaction went through, it would go cha-ching. <laughs> so then I'd go stand in our computer room and it would just go ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Well, Bank of America decided to offer this promotion. <clears throat> And the way it worked was, at that time, anybody that would come in and open up a checking or savings account or buy a CD, they'd send their name to us, we'd pull a credit report, and then calculate their attributes and run it through their criteria for about 13 or 14 different products. And then we'd send back what they qualified for. And so if you went and opened up a checking account, they'd say, oh, Joe, we see you qualify for a credit card. Would you like to take that today? And she said, no, I'd say, well, how about a boat loan? Well, oh, thanks. How about a new car? Well, oh, thanks. And so it would uh, get them going. So they decided to offer this promotional where they'd give somebody a free airline ticket if they'd come in and open up a checking our savings account. Well, people flooded the place. And it flooded us with transactions. And that machine just went to its knees. You know, it was back in the computer room singing, Daisy, Daisy. <laughs> so we named that computer Hal because we were just certain he was trying to kill us all along. <laughs> but it's, it's been a good process, you know, and that one of the things that I, I would really say to you budding entrepreneurs is think long term, you know, don't think about what you're going to do in a year, but what's, what's going to happen in 10, 